it's longer than I have been. Um, so with uh, great pleasure, I have the, uh, the honor of introducing a respected colleague and a friend, Mr. Gary Bergeson. Gary, it's all yours. All right. Thank you, Frank. And it's, a, uh, it's an honor to uh, be here with everyone this morning. And I hope that uh, I can keep you awake as we, uh, as we go through this presentation. Uh, VTI, Ferguson Technology, Inc., is located in the southern Finger Lakes area of upstate New York. Uh, we're centrally isolated in between uh, Elmira and Ithaca, and a broader circle is uh, Binghamton, Syracuse, and Rochester. So it gives you a little bit of an idea. We're, we're about 15 miles north of the uh, New York-Pennsylvania border. Our focus today, we want to build a little bit of uh, knowledge in most of the manufacturing steps uh, that are required to make high quality molded uh, plastic parts that be metalized. If the painting steps uh, can be eliminated, uh, primarily the base coat, quality yields and the profits go up substantially, but it depends on the resin choice, molding finish, stress in the part and other uh, contaminating uh, issues and what the application is that the part's gonna go through. Having a fuller understanding of the manufacturing sequence uh, will help you uh, cut down on the time to troubleshoot problems and save you money. Uh, the, the biggest thing you're gonna see in the presentation is uh, we're doing this uh, in a lean uh, manufacturing standpoint where the parts are molded and directly metalized. So if you have an issue with the, with the part on the press, you can stop the press and fix it before you mold a lot of parts. Uh, another point is uh, selecting the right PVD equipment partner can provide uh, process support for the future. And that's uh, something that's very important to all of us. I've got this little, uh, on my screen, it's a little red box that says material included in full course. Uh, what that means is uh, there's more behind the screen than you can see, but I'm not gonna show you because this is the freebie today, so. Uh, we'll let you, uh, you can ask, ask questions around that. Uh, you've seen the, uh, the abstract. Uh, I think this is a, a, good, a great course for companies looking to get into vacuum metalizing. It's not as easy as uh, you know, buying a metalizer, putting it on your floor, and, uh, and getting it to work and, and making parts. So hopefully this will... Uh, give people some of the knowledge, more holistic knowledge in the uh, everything that's going to be done. A little bit of a history. Um, 20 miles north of VTI is the oldest known continuing operating uh, PVD coating service center, uh, evaporated metal films. Three guys from Cornell University started it and in 1936 uh, Robley Williams uh, received a uh, U.S. patent for a method of coating surfaces by thermal evaporation. Um, around the uh, Second World War, anti-reflective coatings and uh, reflective coatings were being performed on Navy ships. And slightly before that time, uh, second surface coatings on clear plastic, a patent was awarded to, uh, to Gitz. And uh, for people that may not know first and second surface, if you mold a part and you put the coating on the top, that's the first surface. If you mold a clear part and you wanna protect the coating and put it on the backside, that's a second surface. So some of those uh, uh, parts that were made with that patent are, were actually like emblems that go on the, uh, on the outside of a car. In the 50s and 60s, there was a large increase in metallization in automotive interior trim. It was a great thing until the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration uh, eliminated highly reflected surfaces on the inside of cars in, in 67, so blind, drivers weren't getting blinded with reflective light. Mid-60s, the taillight assemblies went from form metal to molded plastics. And at that time, the optics were in the lens. So when you looked at a taillight, of a car, you really, all you saw was the, uh, all of the, the optics. You didn't get to see much of the reflector at all. And most of those taillights used argent paint, which is around 20% reflective. In the 1970s, 
uh, Wilford Jan from Hella uh, invented a what was called the tricoat process. Uh, they took a thermal metallizing system. They put a they have a bank of uh, filaments in there. They had a long single filament that went down the middle that they took um, uh, silicon, uh, uh, silicon and crushed it up, mixed it with a uh, solvent and painted that long skinny filament. They would de deposit the aluminum and then they brought in a HMDSO gas, hexamethyl disiloxane. This is a material that was originally developed as a dry lubricant and how somebody figured out to use it, uh, bring in this uh, monomer and cross-link it into a polymeric coating is, is beyond me. But uh, it's been, been used in the industry now for decades. So they bring in the uh, HMDSO gas. Uh, it starts out as a liquid. They heat it up a little bit to get it to, to flow. You, you monitor and maintain the flow into the chamber. And they had two uh, large area DC electrodes that would uh, generate the plasma of HMDSO. That HMDSO uh, is deposits, it cross-links uh, very perfectly, leaving uh, no holes. It's an excellent corrosion uh, resistant barrier. And, uh, and then they would do the HMDSO and then they would light that long filament uh, with the SIOX on and actually put a scratch resistant and a, uh, uh, a fog reducing coating on top of the aluminum and then the chamber was vented. Uh, with that uh, DC power supplies, they usually covered the uh, electrodes with aluminum foil and the foil had to be changed every, every uh, system. So they licensed that to Stokes Vacuum in the US and Stokes ran with it pretty hard. Uh, they were probably world leaders during their time. And one of those machines that, uh, that Hella worked with Stokes on is, is still operating in one of Hellas plants in Mexico today. <coughs> in the 1980s, thermal evaporated aluminum was uh, used on molded reflectors. Sputtered chrome uh, was, uh, and this actually was John Thornton, was unsuccessfully used on automotive trim at GM. In 1988, the first known rapid cycle metallizer, which we call Pressside today, for automotive lighting was sold by VTI to a company called Truck Light. Uh, it was supposed to be the middle chamber of a three chamber inline and the company buying it did not uh, perform any PVD and they wanted to start with the middle chamber and get their feet wet, which we agreed to. So we uh, designed out the, the valves that would have been between the chambers and just put some hinged doors on that we could remove in the future and the, uh, <clears throat> the, the thing cycled at 30, from door to door in 37 seconds. And uh, it was twice as fast as a molding press. So the, the customer said, we don't need the other chambers. So we lost a lot of sales on that one. <clears throat> in the 1990s, uh, sputtered and arc uh, coatings of stainless steel, chrome, and aluminum were introduced in several automotive uh, production plants, uh, Ford being one, General Motors being the other. And it, during that time period, the optics move from the lens to the reflectors and clear lenses were put on the parts. So the reflectivity and the quality of the PVD films uh, became of critical importance. And it actually added bling to the vehicle in a lot of ways became a, a, a big uh, styling uh, standpoint. In the 1990s and 2000s, <clears throat> there was quite an explosion of rapid cycle thermal and uh, sputtering systems that were sold. These are chambers that are on the order of about a, a cubic meter uh, running three to six minute coating cycles. And one PVD coating system would keep up with two injection molding presses producing large headlights and taillights. In the mid, uh, 2010's alternative for hexavalent chrome electroplating uh, was developed and two, uh, two leaders in, with patents. Uh, one is Sadasa, which today has licensed their uh, 
their technology to Hauser and uh, VTI. Uh, we have a, uh, a, a patent in what we call uh, Super Chrome, and it's been uh, issued in about 25 states, 25 countries, excuse me. There's a wide variety for vacuum metallization, as uh, many of you know, everything from uh, steel substrates to alloys, alloys, of course, cutting tools and, and all that. But today we're focusing primarily on plastics. There are three major areas that uh, equipment is designed around. In the, um, in the, the, old, the old school, large batch coders uh, were chambers in some, some cases six feet in diameter and uh, six to eight feet long. A lot of parts were molded in presses. Uh, they, they were stored up and, and filled in these systems and hundreds of parts would be coated in a cycle. It was a moderate capital cost, <clears throat> high fixturing cost though. Tooling up for one part could easily cost in excess of $100,000. And uh, you had a bit of a compromised quality yield because with, with thermal evaporation uh, spitting off the filaments and molten metal that could drop on the parts uh, were, were issues. Come along uh, VTI, uh, and I kind of call it the scraps that fell off the king's table is now feeding the masses. We came up with this small rapid cycle system that basically you know, could keep up with a large batch metallizer, but we were doing smaller cycles much more faster. <clears throat> we had a lower capital cost, much lower fixturing costs uh, in the order of maybe $10,000 instead of $100, $120,000. Uh, very good throughput, higher quality yield because uh, when you're molding parts as they're coming out of the plastic injection press, if there's a problem with the press, you stop it, fix it, and then continue your manufacturing. Uh, now inline systems uh, are even faster cycling uh, very short cycles. Uh, I can't see some of my writing, but uh, much higher capital cost, but has a greater throughput and very nice and enjoys high quality yields. Uh, but it's very limited on the size of the substrates you can do. It's not the type of equipment you want to do if you want to coat the uh, cell phones and you also want to do tail lights. Uh, it's not very adaptive. So in the old model, Parts, in many cases, the metallizing was done either in the metallizing department or a company that does metallizing as a business. So the parts were molded, they were boxed, they were moved, they were unboxed, they were coated, they were boxed, they were moved, they were unboxed, they were assembled, they were boxed and shipped. And with the new model, with synchronous lean manufacturing, uh, with rapid cycle, the parts are, are molded, they're metallized, they're assembled, they're tested, they're boxed, and they shipped. Um, this saves a lot of floor space, money, and improves the uh, quality of the parts dramatically. Take a look a little bit of the development of, of rapid cycle metallizers. You know, I, often it matches or exceeds the output of a large batch metallizer. Fixturing costs are a fraction of what the large machine uh, fixturing runs positioned uh, very, right next to the molding presses. So molding issues are identified quickly. Polycarbonate and PCABS and other, uh, other resins can be directly coated uh, from the press without a paint base coat. And that's when they are uh, they're the cleanest they're ever gonna be. They're warm and they do not have water vapor in them. Greatly reduces the floor space. In uh, General Motors actually, when they went to the full um, rapid cycle uh, setup, they reduced their floor space requirements by 30%, which was huge. Um, much lower scrap rates. It's below 1% in an industry that was used to 10%. Uh, does not require a clean room, and the sputtering uh, technology provides a very wide variety of color possibilities. This was uh, press side number one for VTI. It was a, uh, a small uh, 250 millimeter uh, T that uh, MDC made for us. 
uh, picture on the right, you can see uh, it was supposed to be a, a three chamber load lock system, but we built the middle chamber, the middle system first. Um, it had a single filament in the door right over here. And one thing we learned uh, very, very early on was uh, when you put a little boron nitride shield behind that filament, that caught um, about 90% of the evaporant that went backwards. And at the end of the shift, you could put your fingernail on the edge of the boron nitride plate and pull that, uh, that sheet of aluminum off and it helped to keep the back door very clean. So this machine did uh, four Ford Explorer high mount stoplights every 37 seconds. And then the speed of the metalizer was faster than the molding press by 25%. The systems uh, requirements started to get a little larger. The, um, this was for the Ford F-150 high mount uh, brake light, which was about 250 millimeters uh, long. Uh, and it was a, a patented uh, brake light because it also had the, uh, the cargo light incorporated into it for the back of the truck. The chamber got a little bit bigger as uh, 762 millimeters by 762 millimeter diameter. It had three filaments inside and this machine cycled every 60 to 75 seconds. <coughs> the, the dependent in the time swing primarily is the, the maintenance that's done or not done on the system. And we got a little cooler. Uh, still a 760-ish uh, millimeter diameter chamber, but a little thinner. And we went to a, a flat fixture. Uh, again, we started with filaments. Over on the right, you can see uh, we had three filaments that came through. These were automatically clamped and unclamped filaments. At the end of the cycle, uh, end of 10 cycles, the operator could lift three filaments off very quickly and easily and drop three in. The uh, consumables for the, the filaments and the, uh, the canes were here in the door, so the materials were uh, right there for the people. What's unique about this system is we made uh, separate pump carts. This is a high vac pump cart. And on this cart, it had its own high back valve, elbow, and diffusion pump, and its backing pump, and all the electronics and, and water cooling uh, required. So literally, in just a couple of minutes, plants that had many of these machines, and we have some, some uh, operations that have 40 of our machines, you could pause the system, take out the hot diffusion pump, bring one in that you have sitting being uh, heated up off on the side, plug it in, crank down the valve, and you're back in production with a, a brand new diffusion pump, and then you can do the, the cool down and the maintenance on that pump cart uh, you know, at your leisure. On the other side of this system, which is not pictured, is a, uh, another pump cart that had a roots blower and a mechanical pump for the roughing. So the first trade show we took this to, people thought we were bringing a uh, washing machine. And we actually won uh, quite a few uh, national design uh, competitions with the uh, firm that we, we used to uh, put this thing together. And another thing to note, instead of a door that hinges out, this door nests down inside the front cover. So when the operator has had their hands on this, uh, this handle, there's uh, switches in here. The door comes up and pulls in about half an inch and seals against the chamber and automatically starts the next cycle. We got a little bit cooler. We took the consumables that were on the top of the door. We redesigned the handle in the front to make it look a little sexier and uh, put the consumables down here. Also, the it was interesting. We sold six of these to Ford, six to General Motors. General Motors uh, wanted us to retrofit their machines with sputtering, which we did. And with Ford, we retrofitted the, their systems with cathodic arc. And we were doing cathodic arc stainless steel on taillights. Systems evolved a little bit more. Uh, we added uh, sputtering capabilities on the sidewalls as well as on the back wall. Uh, these systems are also available with uh, what we called a, a gantry loader, an overhead uh, robotic loader that would lift the heavier fixtures out, spin around, and, and put the other fixture in and start the cycle. 
uh, these still ran a one to two minute cycle time. And on these machines in 96, we introduced dry air venting, which helps to balance the, uh, the cycle times from summer and winter when you've got uh, high humidity and low humidity parts of the year. And so that was an innovation that we've been doing for a long time and other companies and are finally uh, discovering that. The right hand picture, you can see a, a thermal form fixture. This actually is a, a, a polycarbonate fixture that the, these are F's, uh, F-150 taillights. They snap into the backside. There's a, a mild steel uh, washer here on the front and the fixture is just held in the machine with a magnetic uh, coupler. So it's easy to snap the parts into this. Uh, this fixture sold for about $300 and it had a useful production cycle of about one year. Machines keep getting bigger. Uh, parts got bigger, they got more complex. They're wrapped, some of these parts are 20 some inches long um, and they're a foot deep. So it's, uh, the chamber had to, uh, had to increase in size. Uh, we added uh, water traps for to help pump the water vapor out of the system. Uh, this blue tank is a, a clean tank that stores a desiccant dried air that we power vent the system back. So the system comes back from, from vacuum to atmosphere in about nine seconds. Uh, mechanical pumps are located either on the floor or on a mezzanine like you see here. And uh, one of the key things that uh, we learned uh, early on, the closer we could put the roots blower to the vacuum chamber and have a little bit of a vacuum accumulator between the roots blower and the mechanical pump sped up that, uh, that roughing time. So these machines, a uh, little over a, a cubic meter in, in, in uh, volume, pump from atmosphere to uh, 100 millitor in about 25 seconds. So it kind of kind of smokes. In uh, this machine, depending on your maintenance, uh, cycles door to door and in three to five minutes. So two large plastic injection molding presses can feed one of these machines. Uh, we've added the single point loading in here. Uh, one customer had a little bit of issues with their uh, their their staff, so they ordered the single point load where the doors come together, spin around, and then pre presents the coded parts to the operator. So you could either have an operator load and unload these, or like in the previous slide, the uh, a robot can come in here and pick these up and set them down. So they had probably three, at least three robots in this cell. And it was uh, really something to watch. And then these front end rooms can also be uh, positively charged with desiccant dried air to, to really keep the water vapor from the, uh, from the front of the chamber as well. And as you saw in the video, uh, this has about a nine second exchange. And let's see if we can run right through that video. Good. So you have to make a decision uh, and many plants have all three technologies. Uh, are you gonna do thermal evaporation with filaments you're going to uh, sputter or you're going to do arc evaporation. The coating technology that you choose really depends on the materials you want to deposit. Aluminum can be deposited using thermal or sputtering. If you tried to do arc aluminum, you would be making sandpaper. Uh, the lower the melting point material, the arc will th throw it into the, into the plasma and shovels. Uh, the widest range of, of metals and deposition rates can be uh, produced by sputtering. Uh, higher, higher melting point materials would be a little slower deposition rate and the higher melting point is where the cathodic arc really has a, an advantage, a very highly charged flux. The plasma enhanced CVD process um, is not required if you're using uh, paint coatings, but uh, with the electrodes and the gas flow control circuitry, you can add plasma polymerization uh, in almost any system. And it's the same, uh, the same electrodes and power supplies are used for plasma cleaning and for doing the polymerization. Uh, as you can see from the slides down below, which are primarily titanium oxide coatings at different, uh, different thicknesses, you can get quite a wide, wide variety of colors can be produced. 
Uh, this slide uh, gives you a little bit of a, a comparison of uh, thermal sputtering and arc evaporation. Uh, can you deposit metals? Can you deposit ceramics? Uh, will you uh, have issues with the, your deposition material getting poisoned? Uh, how much heat is generated? Uh, do you need a uh, bias substrate? Uh, deposition rate com uh, comparison between them? Relative equipment cost? Materials you can deposit? Uh, alloys you can deposit? Uh, film adhesion? Uh, consumer costs? And, I, and the last one is technical prowess. How good do your technicians and engineers need to be to uh, maintain that system? Now, I'm not, go, not going to get into a lot of uh, electron beam coatings because those are primarily in the optical industry where the parts are in uh, planetaries over the top of the, uh, the crucibles. So we're, we're mainly going to be talking about the uh, uh, thermal uh, filament-based coatings. Taking a little look at the at thermal evaporation, it's low energy vapor uh, with little to no ionization. In the, the picture here, there's a couple different filament types. This is a uh, very standard and th these would be put in the system at a slight angle. Uh, current would, would flow through the filament, the filament would come up to uh, red hot, the aluminum cane will melt and wick its way down the down the coils. Uh, you turn up the current to the device. This will go incandescent just like a light bulb uh, and the vapor boils off and goes across the vacuum space and condenses back on the parts. Simplest technology that, that you can have out there. Uh, there's a couple different types. These are kind of a, a camel looking filament with uh, coils of aluminum on. And this is kind of what it looks like when you're looking through the window when the process is working. Um, it's high current, low voltage, usually 12 or 24 volts. Um, tungsten filaments. Evaporant is, has to be loaded every cycle. Uh, ceramic crucibles are used in roll coders. Electron beam crucibles are used for the optical uh, industry. It has, the parts need to be really clean and it has, I'm saying limited adhesion because it, it's only a thermal process. You don't have any ions, so you don't get any, uh, any ion uh, motion, any movement on the substrate and release of that energy. It's just totally thermal. Generally, it's not useful for doing alloys, although uh, E-beam can deposit it, uh, all sorts of alloy coatings. Uh, high deposition rate. It's good for RFI EMI shielding applications if you're doing aluminum because you put a lot of aluminum down fast and it's, it's the lowest cost technology. Thermal systems come in a, a variety of uh, geometries. Uh, most of what we build here at BTI are vertical machines. Uh, they're two door machines. So when one door is closed being, uh, being coated, the other one is being uh, unloaded and reloaded. So at the end of the cycle, it's about a nine second door exchange. Uh, we have uh, automation packages for the door. So uh, all you're doing is uh, loading and unloading parts. And there are uh, lots of horizontal machines out there. Uh, you pull the carrier out, you reload the filaments. A lot of times these filaments are on a separate little uh, slide that comes out so you can get to them. But you can see these fixtures. Uh, these are four-sided fixtures. And each one of these holes uh, for a uh, uh, e-nickel mask, yeah, you're looking at uh, three to $400 a hole. So these fixturing packages can get very expensive very fast. Uh, you can have single or two-door operation. Usually these large batch coders run in the neighborhood of 20 to 45 minutes. Um, we put bigger pumps on smaller chambers uh, and the, uh, this one that we have uh, cycles 12 to 15 minutes. This is a automated uh, filament exchange uh, patent pending that we have. So you can have a preloaded uh, charge of the number, however many filaments you have in your process, the aluminum is on there. And at the end of the cycle, uh, when the door is being exchanged, the filament is changing and now when it's being coated, 
an operator can reload those filaments uh, while the other door is being coated and you're not losing any cycle time. Taking a, a little look at sputtering, uh, higher energy ion process, about 15 to 100 dB. It's a, it's a momentum transfer. Uh, you've got a highly charged, uh, you've got a high voltage on the, uh, the surface of the, of the cathode. You're ionizing the argon gas that's in there. The gas ion uh, hits the surface of that uh, sputter target and sputters out a metal ion. Um, usually your, your coating distance is two to four inches from the target to the substrate. It can be used to produce compounds and alloys, uh, but if you're, tr if you're doing uh, reactive depositions, the surface of the cathode can, can poison, or you know, if you're doing nitrides, it can nitride over and lose uh, con uh, con <laughs> can lose conduction. Um, it's great with uh, high and low melting point materials, but the yields are a little bit lower on high melting point. It comes in a variety of uh, uh, setups. You can have them balanced or unbalanced in the chamber. High PIMS is new pulsing technology that uh, can uh, use uh, uses high voltage short pulses to uh, kind of what we see is one source can equal uh, two to four source uh, deposition in the machine. They can be planar or flat or they can be cylindrical like a tube um, and they can be powered to AC, DC or RF. And this is just a, uh, a sputtered coating over here, uh, a 10 micron coating. This is actually on an acrylic um, uh, Four thousandths diameter fiber, so this is uh, quite a coating. This 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 actually the heat control that uh, we had to uh, maintain. That's about a thirty hour cycle. There's a lot more behind the the curtain here too. Sputtering equipment can look a lot like uh, the other filament equipment. This is our uh, SC660 Super Chrome machine. It's about thirty eight inches across the uh, the vacuum chamber. Uh, again, same, uh, we like to use the water traps, the dry air venting, uh, high voltage power supplies are kept separate from the three phase and they're kept separate from the, uh, the PLC uh, control bank. Arc evaporation, uh, we're not gonna talk too much about arc. Uh, in the pictures over here, you can see what our uh, switched arc uh, cathode looks like. Uh, door open and, and under operation. We use discrete anodes, which boosts the operating voltage uh, substantially in our process, gives us a higher energy coating. So we get better coatings at lower temperatures. Uh, very high energy process, 50 to 500 EV, and it's a fully, fully ionized plasma. It's high current, low voltage. Uh, we actually use welders for power supplies. Uh, so instantaneously, that solid cathode goes from, from a solid to a plasma and transports across the vacuum space. Uh, we usually have a six to 20 inch source to substrate distance. It depends on the temperature handling uh, of your uh, substrate. Easily produces compounds and alloys. Uh, you can't poison one of these targets. It, it loves to operate in a poison mode because that greatly increases the uh, the melting temperature of the surface, which makes the arc spot go faster. But you can poison, if you're using discrete anodes or even a chamber's anode, you can poison your anodes. And uh, when you lose that electron return path, the, these will turn off. Higher deposition rate than sputtering, but again, more heat is generated. And uh, coatings from low melting point materials will be rough. Uh, and there's several types of configurations you can have a, a random arc where you're not trying to magnetically steer it or switch it. Um, magnetically steered where you're driving it around with a uh, magnetic circuit on the back of it. Uh, this happens to be a, a filtered arc uh, that uh, courtesy of Andre Anders from uh, Lawrence Livermore. And uh, th this is our switched arc. So we literally switch the arc power supply connection back and forth on this to drive that arc uh, back and forth, which uh, gives us uh, smoother coatings and uh, much more 
uh, highly inherent coatings. You can also have, you know, a, this is a planar arc source, so you can have cylindrical just like in sputtering. Uh, arc equipment is primarily used in, uh, for tribological coatings for wear and corrosion resistance. And um, this is our, uh, our current uh, backside of our arc source, and this uh, plate can be inverted to set the process up uh, any kind of configuration you want on the inside. <clears throat> Manufacturing sequences, uh, substrates are molded, and we're gonna talk a little bit about non-base coated or non-painting applications. Um, substrate loading, plasma cleaning, metal deposition, We'll take a look at thermal deposition and sputtering, plasma polymerization, surface energy control. Uh, some, of these, some of these parts have to subsequently get uh, printing and in some cases a tinting uh, put on top. A well-deposited HMDSO coating is, doesn't, doesn't wet. It, uh, it's uh, highly, uh, highly phobic. So. Uh, substrates are reloaded and then uh, we inspect stuff. So <clears throat> when you're molding substrates specifically for non, uh, non, non painting applications, <clears throat> you need to properly store and dry your resin materials. You have to use molding parameters to minimize stress. Uh, it's the temperature of the process, the pressures, the gating, the flow. Uh, and this is not something molders like to do. And thin parts like cell phone covers, the edges uh, can have can be very highly stressed. Uh, sometimes you got to slow the molding process down in order to get the stress out of the part. Why are we worried about stress? If there's a lot of stress or stress areas in the part, the PVD coating doesn't stick as well. Uh, you need to maintain a grade one, uh, A1 grade, number one diamond uh, polished surfaces of the tool for direct metallization. And in polycarbonate, uh, you're gonna be cleaning those molds every six to eight hours to take the, the haze that builds up on the part because that haze will transfer itself into your parts. Uh, you can't use mold release on your tooling and you know it can be done. They do make uh, special grade uh, metallization resins uh, that will come out of the mold, but if you're a shop that sprays mold release on the tool, you're going to have nothing but problems. Uh, you have to use non-powdered latex or nitrile gloves when you're handling the parts and have good glove protocol. You can't put on clean gloves, clean your head, you know, wipe your forehead or your hair and then touch a part. You're going to transfer that dirt to a part. So it's, it takes a little getting used to. Uh, if you're using robotic uh, loading and unloading with the uh, Vacuum, vacuum uh, suction cups. You got to keep the cups clean as those sucker marks will transfer to the part. And once you metalize it, you'll see them. Uh, and uh, in your shipping materials, you can't use wax dividers or, or contaminating packaging. <clears throat> what I mean by that, many of the plastics that are made uh, are sprayed with uh, very thin uh, layers of oil. So the plastic doesn't stick together. But if you put a, a part in that, uh, you're going to be transferring that uh, material onto your substrate. Uh, and you have to ensure the substrates cannot be damaged in shipping. So many times we're working with the molder to design the, the packaging. So the parts are put in, they don't rub against each other. So you, you, don't, you can't bulk pack them into a big bag. Uh, put the substrates in the machine inspect them for damage. Uh, don't coat a damaged part. You're just wasting time and money. Uh, the tooling's got to be maintained and kept clean. Usually in the rapid cycle machines, the tooling's mounted right to the chamber doors. Uh, you got to remove dust. Uh, usually with a, we use uh, clean air, uh, D-STAT. These are, uh, this is a Simcoe top gun in the pictures over here. Uh, we do have dryers and aluminum uh, special lines so we're not putting oil and uh, compressor oil and water on the parts and you start the coating cycle. First thing we do is, is plasma clean the parts. Uh, it's ranged between 20 to 60 kilohertz AC, uh, 5 to 7.5 kilovolts. Uh, we use two electrodes that are 
insulated from the, the vacuum chamber and the, the power is uh, scaled up to the size of the machine. We change the elect electrodes every shift. The uh, electrodes are uh, different geometries and they go in and they just quarter turn and they lock. Um, with DC, like I said earlier, you have to cover them with aluminum foil. In AC, you're kind of switching back and forth so you get a little bit of self-cleaning. Usually argon gas is used uh, to clean the surface. You can use uh, reactive gases like oxygen if you need additional cleaning to take place. Uh, Higher voltages and longer exposure time increases your surface cleaning. But in the case of uh, ABS uh, plastic, you can actually uh, pull the rubber to the surface and give yourself greater adhesion problems by over etching. And you deposit the metal. In thermal evaporation, the chambers pump down new pressure, usually, usually 1.3 to 10 to the minus two Pascal or one to the minus four Tor to get rid of most of the water vapor in there. Um, fil filaments are heated to, to melt and uh, distribute the evaporant and then it's uh, ramped up, boiled off, condenses on your parts and that's a very fast process. Uh, in many cases it, you're talking 30 seconds of coating time to do all those parts. Once all the material is off the filaments, power supplies are turned off. If you don't turn the filaments off, you're going to burn your parts. Uh, you can do dual metal deposition with uh, thermal evaporation, but it takes two separate banks of filaments. So if you're doing uh, uh, RFI EMI shielding coatings and, and two different layers, two different materials are required, it can be done that way. Uh, in sputtering, you got a little bit of, of differences here. You pump down to your predetermined pressures. In some cases, it depends on what you're trying to do. You're down into the eight times 10 to minus five tor range instead of the one to the four. For non-reactive process, the vacuum chamber is backfilled with argon, usually to about a, a micron chamber pressure. Sputter sources are turned on, operated at the prescribed power levels and time to achieve the coating thickness uh, and uniformity that you're looking for. Uh, dual sources, you can either deposit uh, same time uh, from opposite ends of the chamber to, to shorten the cycle time, or you can deposit different materials uh, between the two. And uh, we do a lot of different material coating here with RFI EMI shielding coatings. Plasma polymerization step, the same electrodes and power supplies are used that we use for plasma cleaning. Uh, the, you've got a vacuum tight uh, storage tank of the material that uh, holds the HMDSO and it's only a slight, slightly elevated temperature. Uh, this material is, is very volatile, so you don't want to overheat it. Um, it's a linear poly uh, disiloxane. It uh, produces usually the, the PECVD film that we need for corrosion protection on aluminum is only 15 to 30 nanometers thick. And uh, it gives us excellent corrosion, uh, corrosion resistance and gives you a little bit of wear resistance and you, you have to kind of bump it up with a little oxygen to, to give you uh, at least enough wear resistance to get through the uh, uh, production assembly process. We use uh, vapor mass flow controllers to meter it into the chamber. Um, Power supplies are turned on. Again, these are pretty high voltage, high frequency power supplies and the HMO, HMDSO is cross-linked and forms a nice barrier layer on the coating, on the uh, substrate, excuse me. Picture over here on the right, uh, this actually, here are two of the electrodes. These are <laughs> lights that are reflected on the window, not part of the process. Um, and this is the, uh, the chemical formulation here. And subsequently, if you, if you have to uh, knock down the dyne a little bit to get adhesion for paints or um, printing that has to happen after, after coating, you can adjust that uh, sort of surface energy. Parts are unloaded, reloaded, inspected, and uh, you're off to the races. Setting up for uniformity and coverage. Uh, got to look at the uh, substrate to source distance. Like I said earlier, in sputter sources, you can be uh, two to four inches away, although we do some sputtering uh, 12 inches away. 
uh, substrate geometries and throughput requirements. You got to figure out uh, what you need for your fixturing. Uh, the little video over on the right, those are uh, what we call mirror scalps. The fastest coating that you can uh, put down is a simple drum style over here on the left. Part is just rotates by the sputter sources. But when you're in a, uh, a planetary, planetary operation, uh, that can reduce your, uh, your deposition rate 30 to 70%. So you're going to have to coat longer to get all those parts done, but you're doing more parts in one cycle. And then the, uh, uh, the picture in the middle is uh, Rolf Isley's uh, planetary patent uh, from a long, long time ago, 1964. Uh, it shows the, uh, uh, the crucibles in the bottom of the chamber and the uh, substrates are uh, suspended from the top planetary which is uh, mostly how your optical coatings are done. Got to calculate your power and your evaporant loads. That's done with trial and error. Uh, for evaporation, arc and sputtering, all three of these are line of sight processes. Uh, thickness of the, of the coating you're going to put on the part depends on your distance, the angle, whether you're doing it uh, in a drum, uh, simple, planetary or, or three-axis rotation. Uh, three-axis greatly improves uniformity and it's used mostly on things like cutting tools and tribological coatings. Uh, very high aspect ratios, parts that are uh, small in diameter and, and really deep are problematic uh, to get the same, uh, get a usable thickness coating down on that part. Your uh, uh, PECVD is, is non-directional. You know, it's a CVD process, so you can, you can get down into nooks and crannies pretty well, although you still have issues with, with throwing power. Um, thin coatings uh, work very well, and if you try to build up the PECVD uh, thick, parts are going to get hot and they're going to get yellow. Equipment strengths and weaknesses. Uh, this, this one's going to be, in the course, uh, uh, very detailed. Um, you've got to look at the process complexity, the personnel required, and the operating costs and configurations of each. You've got large batch, you know, small rapid cycle batch machines, and inline machines. And this concept, uh, inline machine, you know, in, in comparison, a lot of the old uh, large batch machines were three hundred thousand um, dollars some of our larger uh, rapid cycle machines are in the ballpark of six to seven hundred thousand dollars inline machines are easily uh, one to three million dollars so and this uh, shows a robot uh, load loading and unloading the substrates it, it swings around goes through the coder and, and comes back through for uh, cool down, loading, and unloading. General types of coatings. You got reflective coatings, you got electronic shielding coatings, decorative coatings, protective coatings. These are a few examples here. We've got uh, about 1.6 microns of aluminum on a cell phone. Uh, these are really fun from a masking standpoint because you've got to mask a lot of little areas. You got to mask the inside of the buttons. You got to mask one millimeter down all the way around in this thing. This actually is arc deposited stainless steel uh, launched on the 95 Mustang taillights. And uh, that machine coated uh, the coating cycle for four of these, just the coating portion of it was uh, 13 seconds. Uh, here are uh, some examples of uh, aluminum coated parts. I don't see the color much on my uh, screen here, but the, this part has a, a little bit of a gold tone paint that's put over the top. And this is a VTI Super Chrome on a, a mirror scalp on a PSA vehicle. Looking at reflective coatings, there's many different uh, metals based on the reflectivity and the color that's required. Uh, silver is, is very high uh, in reflectivity, but difficult to protect from corrosion depends on where the part is. Most of the parts that we coat are outside. Um, production aluminum uh, is 85, 92% uh, reflective. Depends on, again, how far you pump down, getting rid of those uh, contaminants in the system. 
And you can get bump that up to 95% if you're doing enhanced aluminum with uh, uh, dielectric uh, stacks on it. Chromium comes in around 65% reflective, stainless steel 60, uh, titanium 50. All of these have slightly different colors and automotive stylists are some of the persnicketiest people you'll ever run into. Uh, they're relatively thin. These coatings are 60 to 80 nanometers uh, thin uh, and it's very low, low heat load. Uh, they're op opaque at about 120 nanometers. And we talked about the, uh, the enhanced with the dielectrics. Electronic shielding coatings are a little thicker. Uh, it can, uh, it depends on the frequency, the distance from the emitter relative to the emitted wavelength, whether you're near field, uh, far field, it can be single layer, uh, like a thick layer of aluminum or multiple layers, it can be several microns in thickness. And with sputtering, uh, you can have a relatively high heat load. And the, uh, the chart over on the right shows the different, uh, different frequencies for everything from uh, AM radio to uh, radiometric imaging. Very, very high use in uh, medical communications, military vision systems, and automotive uh, advanced drive assistant systems, your self-driving cars. Uh, it shows a couple of different uh, coatings here. You can have uh, thick copper coatings with a nickel, nickel chrome, or aluminum overstrike to protect the copper for corrosion. And those are, those are usually uh, 0.1 ohms per square at about one point, a little bit more than 1.5 microns thick. Uh, thick aluminum coatings like on the, on the phone here is much less demanding in application. Usually that, those specs are one to three ohms per square and are usually around a micron thick. Can be done pretty quickly. Decorative coatings are all over the map. Um, you get, uh, there's all, many gold tone targets that they make, uh, big, different copper and aluminum alloys to give you all, a whole range of, of, of different golds. You can do it uh, with reactive sputtering, bring in uh, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen uh, bearing gases to get different colors and materials. You can paint tint top coat. Uh, the most one one is black. Everybody wants black. And that's one of the worst ones to try to, to try to get to it. It requires a carbon source someplace. Uh, these are the uh, Estee Lauder Modern Muse uh, store di displays. Uh, VTI coded uh, the worldwide supply uh, for those here. And that was, the, those were some interesting colors. <clears throat> Protective coatings, uh, we talk about uh, PVD. Uh, HMDSO is the most common precursor used and there are others. Uh, it's silica-like, uh, it, it can be hard when you buffer it with some more oxygen with low index indexes. Uh, it can be more polymeric, uh, better for your corrosion protection. You can do uh, SiO2, SiOx with uh, PVD, a little more persnickety, a little harder to control, but uh, there are, uh, you know, everybody wants something that's the right color, uh, the right thickness, and they want it to last forever and never be scratched. Yeah, but remember, you're putting coatings on a plastic part. It's like an M&M. It's going to be only as good as, as the uh, candy shell on the outside. Talk a little bit very quickly about uh, some of the resins. Um, in 1995, there were over 18,000 different materials av available for injection molding. Uh, many improvements, uh, properties, and availabilities have been made over the years. Thermal plastics are material that, when heated, undergoes a physical change, can be reheated and reformed over and over again. Thermal sets are materials that when heated undergoes a chemical change and cures, it cannot be reformed. Um, thermal plastics are, can be ABS, polycarbonate, nylon, styrene, and the list goes on. Your thermal sets, uh, BMC, which is bulk molded compound, or sheet molding compound, SMC, uh, can be molded. The surface is kind of smoky, it's a little rough, and your coating's gonna look rough as well. Uh, 
Uh, many of these materials have to be paint base coated in order to uh, put PVD on top. Uh, thermal plastics come into two big categories, amorphous or crystalline. Uh, amorphous uh, generally is, is clear, low shrinkage, softens, has high impact strength, poor chemical resistance, poor lubricity. Crystalline usually uh, is opaque, has high shrinkage, melts, low impact strength, good chemical resistance, good lubricity. Uh, and the PET and other materials are crystalline, yet they're crystal, they're crystal clear. So they kind of don't fit this uh, opaque mold. Here's just a few, a few of the different materials and their abbreviations. Uh, as we throw around ABS and PC and PPS, uh, this gives you a little bit of a cross-reference to go back to. Um, a lot of these materials have, have fillers in them, uh, primarily glass or minerals. Uh, minerals uh, is usually added for fire retardants. Uh, sometimes the fillers are put in there to reduce the cost of the resin and make it stronger. Uh, they, can, they can affect greatly the, uh, your uh, molding parameters and the, the PVD finish on these parts. Uh, high amounts of fillers can not only give you adhesion issues, uh, it can give you appearance issues as well. You look at the different applications and what resin you're trying to pick, you've got to go against the what you're trying to achieve with the customer specifications. Is it interior application? Is it exterior? Uh, does it have to pass the pocketbook test? Does it ha what, what are the chemical, environmental, and wear tests it's got to do? Um, your uh, a lot of your fire retardant materials are in medical and in uh, airline uh, applications. Mold release is in the issue, is in the resin, and uh, metallization grades. Uh, you don't have any adhesion, you know, very few heat adhesion problems with those materials. Fillers and regrind, uh, and regrind's a bad one. Uh, you want to reduce the cost. You want to reuse the parts that you molded that are bad. They throw them in a the grinder, they grind them back up, and they feed that back in with the resin. Sometimes uh, some customers will use as much as 20% regrind. Um, that's, you're going to see that in the finish of the part. You can't mold the part uh, as, as smoothly in the case of polycarbonate as you could with the, uh, the virgin material. These are some uh, characteristics of the Hygroscopic resins and non-hygroscopic resins. Um, some will uh, absorb moisture. Uh, polycarbonate is uh, one like that. Moisture will go through it. When we're doing polycarbonate uh, uh, housings for the automotive industry, we actually put down a HMDSO base coat, aluminum layer, HMDSO top coat. So we sandwich that, that coating in between two uh, two HMDSO layers. Um, so a little bit of background here on the resins, a uh, little background here on vacuum drying and the importance of that. And uh, I've got some, some good reference materials if you really want to get into it. But when you're, when you're fighting an adhesion problem in the metallization process, it might not be the PVD problem. You know, you've got to, sometimes you're going back to the molder and you're finding out that uh, the plant says we have no, no silicone mold release in here. And we spent two weeks at one customer's site. Uh, and at near the end of the two weeks, um, we found over 30 spray cans of silicone mold release. And once, once they really uh, kibosh the use of that, the, uh, the problem magically went away. Molding issues and impact on the PVD. Um, and again, this is, uh, you know, we're looking as, at as molded materials. Paint base coatings uh, cover up a variety of sins. It can cover up contaminants on the parts, it can cover up scratches, and give you a surface that's more predictable to metallize. But uh, many paint operations have extremely high um, quality issues. Uh, easily 10% uh, uh, scrap because of inclusions, runs, drips, sags, all that type of stuff. Uh, 
parts that are coated immediately after molding are free of most contaminants and moisture. Uh, you got to maintain the quality of the mold and molding flaws are, are quickly identified. Uh, we will get in, in the full course, we'll get into uh, much more detail, but here you can see, if I can find my pointer, uh, a knit line is where the material comes around and you have a cold joint. And uh, unless you're paint base coating that, and even if you are paint based coating it, you'll still see it. Um, splay is moisture in the part. You can see these little ghosty lines. Um, if you got splay in the substrate, when you metalize it, you're going to have that splay appearance on, on the metal because it's a rough area. This is gate blush. Could be uh, too high a pressure at the gate. It's hard to see here, but this, this is an ejector pin mark. Uh, the ejector pin actually pushes on the back side of the part, but they got a little bit of a, uh, uh, a blemish that shows through once the parts are metalized. Um, I don't have an example here of uh, uh, sink marks. Uh, sink marks are when there's a boss on the back side and the material sinks in, and you can kind of see that boss on the uh, front of the part. These are uh, uh, very good uh, references for the layman and and for the expert in, in molding. The one that's I think you're going to find most interesting from a PVD standpoint is this one right here, uh, Injection Molding Troubleshooting Guide. And uh, so there's all the uh, uh, ISBN numbers to, to look at these. The molding guide is the one that gets into all the issues that you're trying to eliminate to get a good PVD coating to adhere. Uh, paint base and top coat, we're not going to go into much detail here today, um, but you got to know uh, for the application what kind of paint's required, um, what kind of thickness, uh, is it going to be a UV cure paint or is it going to be a thermal cure paint, is it going to be a powder coat, um, is it going to be electrostatic, you know, is a substrate, uh, we're talking mainly plastics here, but many, uh, many uh, Electrostatic powder paints are uh, conductible, uh, conductible surfaces or metal. Uh, and you, in some areas, you can't paint. Uh, it's pretty tough to do spray painting in California. And you've got to be concerned with your waste stream management. What are you going to do with your waste paint? Um, some of these the tr traditional spray painting, very low transfer um, efficiency, maybe 10%. 90% is in the filters and all over the place. So what are you going to do with those filters? Um, you can spray electrostatically or static. You can, you can dip uh, and you can do flow coatings. Kind of the parts are moving through a conveyor and you've got a little rain of paint coming down. The parts are tipped and tumbled and the paint is uh, made uniform through that. And then they're cured either uh, in UV or thermal. Uh, UV curing is very quick. In a matter of 20 seconds, um, 20, 25 mils of paint goes from a liquid to hard as glass. Oops. Oh, I guess my light just went out. Still see me though. Um, so the leveling, the adhesion, the moisture migration in the paint, uh, Top coating, uh, you got to look at uh, what abrasion uh, resistance is needed, corrosion resistance, color tinting, and finish. Is, is it going to be a gloss finish or matte finish? What's the size of your substrate? What's your, your quantity you're trying to push through and what are the quality? And what level of automation do you want to put in? Uh, many, uh, many plants, there's, there are people every, all over the place and um, in some plants there's there, we do have installations where the the whole process goes from resin to packaged part, and there's nobody in the cells. It's totally robotic. When you're specifying a paint line, uh, it's almost it's probably more difficult than specifying a PVD machine. Uh, you got to know you know what is the process, what is the geometry, what is the throughput. You got to look at the applications. Is it, it going to be sprayed, flowed, dipped? Um, what kind of uh, you know, equipment costs can, can, be, can easily be as much or more than the PVD system? 
And what is your tolerance for scrap rate? Um, UV has an advantage over thermal cure. Uh, it does, it can cost more for the power supplies and the lights. It's, uh, it's UVC, so it's COVID killing. Run your people through there and you'll keep them in good shape. Uh, but it's got advantages and disadvantages. And there's more that uh, you'll hear in the other full course. This is a, uh, a line that Spremog uh, designed for us. Uh, it takes the output of, of three, three press side 4000s down here in the bottom, goes through and actually it uses, it's got three different uh, cleans. So it's got a, a D-stat, it's, it's got a flame, and it's got a Corona cure to really clean, clean, clean the part to get that dust off. And then it goes through robotic spraying, goes through what's called a flash tunnel. Usually it's about 10 to 12 minutes, gives the paint time to level out, become very glass-like and smooth. And the parts go through the UV cure tunnel, comes back through cool down, and is loaded and reloaded. Spree Mike's got a lot of uh, very uh, cool designs. I think they're one of the more uh, innovative, uh, uh, innovatively advancing companies. Fixturing and masking, like anything, uh, you can you can make or lose profits uh, with with how you're handling the parts. We deploy many techniques and methods to make uh, coating fixtures. Uh, some are machined, some are uh, electroless nickel. You can laser cut, water jet, vacuum form, cast, 3D print, and then precision masking uses a combination. There's a couple examples here. Uh, the vacuum form masks, the parts just clip and snap into it. It's lightweight, pretty easy to store. Here we've got uh, laser cut and a combination of cast. These are doing, um, I don't think they were cell phones. It looks like it might have actually been a, a bit of a calculator base. And then here's a combination of machined and e nickel masks. Uh, some of these uh, price can drive up pretty, pretty fast. Uh, in PVD, what you'll find is the designers of the parts never talk to the PVD people. They design parts that have negative angles that you've got to get coating around the backside of. And, you know, every once in a blue moon, you get somebody smart enough to want to talk to you before, uh, before they design the part, but it's extremely rare. There are some uh, coating uniformity modeling uh, programs out there in the 10 model and uniformity pro. You've got to do a bit of manipulation with some of these things and we'll be going through that in a little more detail. So you got to look at uh, also mask cleaning doesn't do you much good to have a, a fancy mask and your it depends on the material you're coating if you've got a a, a stainless steel mask and you're coating it with chrome how are you going to remove the chrome from that so you got to look at your cleaning methods the frequency uh, you let the coating build up too thick you've got something that's a gas sponge and you're releasing contaminants into your coating cycle and if you're trying to do very low uh, resistance RFI EMI shielding coatings, uh, you're going to be fighting yourself with dirty fixtures. Got to be able to load them and unload them easily, uh, fully changing a set out during the coating cycle. So you have one fixture in being coated, you're loading and unloading another one. They need to be lightweight, easy to use, and have a reasonable lifespan. These are um, Ericsson cell phones that were being uh, coated in our Presside 3000 out in uh, at SPM Dynacast in California. So we had to mask, you can see some of the mask uh, requirements on your inside, each, each key area had to be masked. So these were uh, cast masks that we made here at VTI. Uh, you would spend a lot of money trying to machine all those. So we actually made rubber tooling, uh, multiple sets of the rubber tooling, and so we were casting 10 to 20 of these at a time. Equipment selection. Uh, later on, we will be going uh, in the full course in, in much more depth in this. Uh, what kind of pumping? Diffusion pumps are your lowest cost pump, uh, but you've got to design in the fact that uh, 
if you don't do things right, you can get oil backstreaming into your into your chamber and contaminate your process. Turbo molecular pumps are get pretty much one of the wider, more widely used pumps. Uh, it it spins up. Uh, there's there's no regeneration to it. You uh, there's no oil backstreaming through it. Um, they're they're nice pumps to work with, but you do have an issue of getting the uh, having to deal with the time of uh, spooling that up and then spooling it back down again. So valving and isolation is important. Cryo pumps are 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 pretty fast. Uh, they they freeze the gas out of the vacuum chamber. And the problem with a cryo pump is you've got to regenerate them and a very fast regeneration time with a cryo pump might be two to four hours. And cryo pumps do not like helium leak detecting. It'll take a cryo pump out like that. And uh, it takes a lot of work to clean them up after that. Got to look at your substrate uh, motion you want to uh, put in there. Do you, if you're going to need planetary, it's got to be designed into the machine. You can't easily just add it after the fact. Um, and if you're looking at uh, evaporation, uh, you got to look at your charge refill, uh, especially if you're doing shielding applications and um, single shot. Interesting. I don't know what that what that means. Uh, in sputtering, you got planar rotary, and in some uh, processes, you need to put a shutter over the sputter source. So, uh, first, when you turn it on, you're sputtering onto the shutter, not onto the substrate. So when your first few uh, ions are arriving on the substrate, they're absolutely clean and they're, they're not uh, cont contaminated from, uh, say something like uh, uh, the vent gases coming back into the chamber. Process monitoring or not. You kind of want, you want to keep it simple. Uh, some people use a power versus time uh, kind of process setup, but when you need more, there's emission spectroscopy and speed flow, um, optical thickness measuring, rate monitors, uh, residual gas analyzers for looking what's in there. The, the simpler you can make the monitoring, uh, the, the longer your process integrity will hold up. Uh, one thing that we're always involved in is trying to make that operating window as big as possible so that when everything is clean and really nice, you can start up here and then as the process degrades, 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 which it will, uh, with dirty fixtures, dirty chamber, uh, cathode erosion, you get down to where you need to do something, it, you, maybe you've spent uh, uh, a, a few shifts or a few days getting there and then uh, you clean it back up and you're back to normal again. So in the case of liners, uh, we always send, you know, you need to have multiple sets of liners. So you, you pull out a set, put a clean set in as quickly as possible and you're, you're back in operation. This, this section with a full course is going to be fun. Uh, when a process goes rogue and they will go rogue, uh, you'll have all sorts of different uh, issues, whether it's uh, thermal evap or sputtering. Uh, base coating can be bad. You can have adhesion, wrong color, your electrical resistance, you got contaminants, uh, top coating can screw something up. If you have a, uh, an air leak in a system, you can have dark colors. If you got a water leak in the system, uh, you can have rainbows. Uh, your cycle time will drift all over the place uh, and you can have uh, coating issues. Everything from, this is orange peel on the side of this. Uh, the, the base coat was rough. Iridescence, this is possibly caused with uncured base coat. Uh, you got outgassing coming uh, when the aluminum is arriving on that surface. Uh, doesn't show up very well, but runs aren't ex acceptable. Um, when you're setting a process up, sometimes you overheat some parts and they melt. Right, Josh? <laughs> and uh, you can have inclusions. Uh, a speck of dirt that gets in the part. Uh, some customers will let you have uh, an inclusion for so many inches, but the larger the part you have, uh, the more difficult it is to get a perfect part. Adhesion can be the wrong base coating. Uh, 
wrong solvent or thinner used in the paint um, expired the shelf life's bad you've got oil or uh, mold release on the substrate it can come from your blow off air if you're not uh, cleaning your air up and or fingerprints if it's a fingerprint you can find who did it because actually Edwards makes uh, thermal uh, deposition machines for uh, uh, forensics uh, you can be in uh, improperly cured uh, you can be over cured, you can be under cured. So there's a lot of lot of little little angles here to, to be uh, knowledgeable about. Uh, okay, these are other areas that we're going to get into. Uh, Paint-based coating adhesion. So you got the adhesion of the, the base coat to the substrate. You got adhesion issues from the metal layer to the base coat or the metal layer to the substrate. Uh, top coat to the metal layer. Uh, you can have contaminants in there and uh, you can have issues with your HMDSO top coat as, as well as the uh, paint. Coating color. Um, your deposition pressure could be too high. You've got air leaks. You've got volatiles uh, in or on the substrates. You can have uncured base coating. Your filaments are on too long after the evaporant's gone and you're burning your parts. You can have back, back streaming from your vacuum pumps. Coating can be uh, too thin. Uh, if you've got uh, dark substrates like black and you're, you're only uh, a couple hundred nanometers, you're going to be able to see some of that black through. And that's one way that people do uh, what's called dark chrome. You use a black substrate and you control a layer of, of the metal that you're putting on top. You have dark spots, you can get iridescence, splatters, fish eyes, rainbows. Um, you name it, you can get a, a, lot of different, uh, a lot of different issues with with your coating color. Inspection techniques, um, we're gonna be doing a lot of, a lot of witness samples. Uh, usually people start with flat plaques and then move on to uh, doing your geometry work because most of the uh, analysis techniques require flat plaques. Uh, reflectivity, we use an integrating sphere and a certain color laser. You can use spectrometry. Um, corrosion resistance, uh, you can do caustic testing you know, on the site, either with drop or immersion, um, uh, NaOH or KOH. And we've seen uh, percentages of uh, anywhere from 1% to 10%, uh, and anywhere from one to 10 minutes of, you know, we put a drop on there and it's gotta make it through 10 minutes, you rinse it off and you can't see where it ate through the coating. Um, weatherization tests going up and down in temperature and up and down in humidity. Um, those are, you know, there's, there are probably 50 different tests that the automotive industry uses uh, on these, on looking at uh, PVD films. Film thicknesses, we use profilometry here. We also have optical methods. Um, and there's pros and cons comparing the different methods. Adhesion, most adhesion tests, believe it or not, are the old, tape pull test. You cross hatch the part, cut through the coating into the substrate, uh, put the specified tape on, rub it, let it set or not. There's, there are specs and tape tests and rip it off and look for uh, how much, if any, of the coating came off. Color measurement is done with LAB, most common. And then uh, looking at the intrinsic stress of the uh, coating, uh, we, we coat uh, silicon wafers here and use uh, profilometry. Uh, but you also have to account for the thermal differences between the coating, the measurement, and the test and use environments. For uh, people that like uh, fun graphs, this discusses the compressive uh, and tensile stress that the coatings build up. Uh, what more people are used to is the Thornton model, uh, depicts the coating structure changes from uh, from the substrate temperature and the processing pressures. So you can see that uh, temperatures can widely affect the, uh, the growth of the film and what the characteristics of the film are. We're looking for films that uh, are lowly stressed or properly stressed. In some cases, the use of the part uh, gets, the part gets heated up quite a bit and the coating's gotta be able to expand with the part and then contract with the part and not crack. And uh, that uh, it takes a little bit of effort. 
Uh, Stoney equations uh, can be used for uh, measuring the curvature. Uh, we use a, a DECTAC profilometer for that. We look at uh, surface energy. We, we need to measure that. Um, you've got uh, on the left, you've got your hydrophobic, uh, very low dyne surface energy. Uh, we're usually in, you know, around 40-ish uh, dyne for most of the coatings that we do. Um, and it can be as, as, as high as 65 dyne uh, for your hydrophilic coatings. So we're looking at the contact angle measurement and that's what these, uh, this slide predicts or projects. So how do you do that? You, you have your substrate, you put a drop of liquid on there and you put a little backlight behind it and you look at it. And if, if this is a, a very low um, or very high surface energy, this drop will be really flat. If it's very low surface energy, the drop will have more energy than the surface and the drop will look like a BB sitting on the surface. Um, you can use uh, Dyne Testing Limited over in England makes, uh, makes these uh, Dyne pens, different Dyne levels. And this is a, these are good tests for, for having on the production floor, although these, these pens have a, a pretty short shelf life. But you can, uh, if you've got an adhesion problem for your PVD coating, you can uh, use these pens to see what that surface dyne is. And that's how you kind of dial in your etching uh, prior to uh, your PVD. And then uh, Rame Hart uh, Instrument Company makes the, this base model of a uh, uh, surface angle uh, system. And then this one's a little fancier with an environmental controlled uh, chamber on it for, uh, for looking at uh, higher level stuff. Disruptive technologies, uh, you've got reflective paints that are out there. You've got, you know, the, the plating industry is working really hard to try to find a way to reuse those, uh, those chemical tanks for plating. Uh, so there's a lot of materials being developed there. You have in mold decorating where you're putting down uh, uh, a flashy film uh, in the mold and then molding into that. So we'll get into some other disruptive technologies uh, in this uh, deeper course as well. I wanna thank you. I hope uh, everybody stayed awake and I hope that we are fortunate enough to uh, be able to see you at the 2021 TechCon. Thank you. So Gary, thank you very much. Uh, I'll admit that I did stay awake. <laughs> uh, and uh, we had uh, uh, a very healthy participation. And we have uh, two questions uh, in the chat box from uh, Vishal Baloria. But what I am going to do is unmute everyone's microphone and provided we don't get into a Donnybrook, allow for a little bit of group discussion uh, so that uh, it becomes a little bit more personal than just uh, kind of writing in a, uh, uh, a question. So. Uh, Vishal, your, your microphone is enabled, so uh, why don't you take a, 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 a first stab at uh, one of your two questions. We do not, I do not hear you. Gary, do you hear Vishal? No. Might have his microphone muted. So while, while we're working through that issue, so the first question was, can you share any tips to increase coating adhesion on plastics other than taking the full course? Um, plasma cleaning. You know, it's, you, you really want to stay away from uh, any wet chemistry cleaning of plastic because usually everything that uh, we see has blind holes in it. And if it doesn't have a blind hold in it, it's got a, a pressed in uh, threaded uh, bushing and liquid will wick in there 
and whether any liquid, if it's a alcohol based or water based, and you got to get it out of there. So you're really trying to keep the substrates clean. You're trying to keep them dry. Um, preheating the substrates sometimes will help. You know, heat them up to um, 140 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, so heating, uh, keeping your fingerprints off from them, <laughs> keep your darn hands off of those things. Um, and plasma cleaning, if you do have plasma cleaning, will help. But also, uh, you could have adhesion issues if your film is too thick. The thicker you build your coating, the more stress you have in the coating, and that stress can um, overtake the uh, adhesion to the substrate. Fantastic. Uh, second question. Vishal, is your uh, microphone functional? Functional? Can we hear you? So, Vishal, second question, and it's the second question of uh, those that have been submitted, is how is coating color and thickness controlled? Uh, coating color uh, is controlled three major ways. Um, if it's, if you're trying to get a certain color, uh, let's say you've got a you really want a bluish uh, chrome look. Um, chrome, of course, is, is, makes, the, makes that up. If you can get the color that you want with the target material alone, that'll give you the most uh, reproducible color in your process. If you're doing color by a reactive process, um, that's gonna have different color issues on a part that's very deep. Uh, you're going to get one, you could, you could get one color um, on the bezel and you could get a different, slightly different color in the bottom. So reactive depositions, though you can get a lot of cool colors, um, reactive depositions are better for parts that are more two, two dimensional, you know, not three dimensional. Um, and another thing that affects color, uh, is, is what vacuum level are you pumping down to? If you're only pumping down to, you know, five times 10 to minus four tor, um, you're, you're not getting rid of all the water vapor in the chamber. And any contaminants that are in the chamber are gonna react with the, the ions and transport and give you different colors there. So your, your uh, cleanliness of your chamber is gonna have an effect on your color. So keep your liners clean, uh, keep your fixtures clean, as clean as you can. Um, and you know, all those things in combination will, uh, will affect your coating color. Are there any more questions from the team? With that, let me thank you all again for joining us. And let me hope that all of you stay safe and well. And we hope to see you next year at the Tech Con. Thank you, Gary. All right. Thank you. See you all. Bye now. Thanks.